Welcome back to the Media Time Show featuring Lenny, the only NFL podcast where one of the hosts prefers two bowls to Todd Bowls. One for food, one for water. That's Lenny. I'm Mina Gimes. I am joined on this delightful June afternoon by my longtime friend, Kevin Clark. Welcome back to the show. Hey, pal. What's going on? You know, just day 16 of where will DeAndre Hopkins end up? I've uh, hit that wall where I just have been saying wherever he wants, uh, which is great content. Uh, that is not something we will be discussing on today's show. The, have, you, have you done? And, well, I was going to say Hopkins and the A's relocation to Vegas are the two <laughs> things that I wish I could just mute all references to. Just let me know when it happens. Let me know when it's done. Like, I, I like the idea of just like every reporter having two different teams that seem disconnected from the report before it. it it's really, it's special stuff. I, I, I'm also just, I'm really fading the Hopkins story because it's like impossible to really talk about without knowing his priorities. If he cares about money, he will play on XYZ, Cleveland, Detroit. Right. I don't know if he cares about the Super Bowl, he'll try for Kansas City. I, I don't know. I don't know. So we'll see. When it happens, guys, listeners, I will, of course, get into it because I do think it'll be a very impactful signing because I think he's still an impactful player but we are not here to talk about players or at least not uh, directly we are here to do something that I actually don't think I have done before so that's exciting um I've ranked offenses I've ranked defenses we're gonna do that in the coming weeks I've ranked quarterbacks that's what we did last week but I have not ranked NFL coaches uh, and that is what you are here today to do. Kevin Clark, who, by the way, guys, you should check out Slow News Day, Kevin's podcast, also a video series. You can check it out wherever you get, I guess, I was about to say wherever you get your pods. Spotify is where you can well, check it Well, it's on Apple, but you don't get okay. to see me. And what's uh, the point? Okay. Yeah. Why? You yeah, know, the video. There's what's a video component on this podcast. There's on Spotify. Too, yeah. Oh, ooh. Yeah, YouTube. On check Spotify or anywhere? Oh, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. just YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um... But uh, yeah, check it out. Um, Kevin, we're, we're going to do so. So we're going to spend the first half trying to decide or debate or discuss who the top 10 coaches in the NFL are. Okay. And this one, that was a little bit the parameters for that. I, I just said, we're, this is pretty much a straight up power ranking. Um, it was an insane request. You just said, we're just going to rank the dudes. That's what literally well, what you said. You were I just like, not for this year. You said, not for this year, not historically. Well, we're just going to rank the dudes. It was an it's insane. Sort of this year. You were in it, your bag with that text. What I meant was, it's not like, it, okay, there's, for example, you could do all time. You could do one game. Who would you want? You could do if I was starting a new team. Like, there's so many different ways you could approach the coach question. And for quarterback, I, you know, set some pretty clear parameters. Um, with this one, I just wanted to say who, like right now, who do we feel are the top 10 coaches in the NFL at this moment in time? And then in the second half of this podcast, um, we're going to do something that, uh, really for me, it just kept popping up in my head while I was doing the X factors, which is pick each of us are going to name five coordinators who we think could determine the success of their, their relative teams, respective teams rather this season. Um, because when I was doing the X factors for a lot of the teams, it was a coordinator, I realized, and not like a random, you know, linebacker. So we're, that'll be fun because I think I was surprised, but I, I could have could have done like 10 more, you know, like there's so many pivotal coordinators, but we're not getting to the coordinators. We're focusing on the big dogs. So uh, here's how I want to do this. We're not doing a draft or anything like that. I'm going to get my top five and then you're going to give your top five. We're cool. going to discuss them. Okay. I did. I did a top ten. That's amazing. No, 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 no. And then oh. we're gonna do the t six through ten, and then we're gonna do six through ten, and then we're gonna discuss them. Oh, so we're going five that, through yes. one, and then six through ten. Yes, exactly. Okay. So we're doing one. We're, we're doing it. We're doing it from the top to the bottom. We're doing one through okay. five, one through five, six through ten, six through ten. Okay. <laughs> I think if I had to self scout a little bit, uh, you're Kyle things, Shanahan. The tendencies. Uh, I, I'm thinking of some tendencies here. I, I I I tend to struggle with clock management, which is why okay. I want I'm grouping these into one in, into five, kind of two groups because if I feel that if we did one through ten for each, uh, we'd probably be through halfway through this podcast and it would be like an hour at that point. So I feel like this mm. is a good way for me to keep my arms around the clock, which is 
my biggest challenge as a as the the person the host of this podcast. All right, we're digging, we're jumping into it. Um, I found my top five was a lot easier than my. I think you know you can quibble. There's we'll hear like your list, but one through five was much easier for me than six through ten. I'm gonna start there. Um, so. Yeah, I feel like we're all we're, we're going to vaguely have the same top six guys. or whatever. Yeah. Yes, top six. But then it gets it gets crazy, and I had a lot, and I kept changing guys and putting guys on. I have I so I have I have literally probably three thousand words of notes for two, three guys who are not in my top ten because yes. I kept ranking different people ten. It's the it, there's right outside the top ten. I have like four names that I kept putting in the ten and then pulling out of the ten. And then I kept like, trying to not rank Doug Peterson, and he kept okay. finding a way. He kept he is, finding he is, a way. He's the fringe guy for me. We're not. He he's not in my top five. Right. So here's my top five. Right? Not in top five. But it's top ten. <laughs> here's my top five of the top ten. Okay, I'm gonna say my one through five. Then you can do yours, and then we will discuss. My number one coach in the NFL right now is one. Andrew Reed. Same. Oh, and Andy Reed. Two. We might deviate here. I have Kyle Shanahan. Three. Mike Tomlin. Four. John Harbaugh. Five. I threw. I threw in Sean Payton at five. I've got it. He's he's mm. back, and he's. I, I I kind of flipped him in six a few times, so I think you go either way. Who do you? Who's your top five? Ooh, okay. Number one, Andrew Reed, same as you. I just, I just don't like, I was looking at Patrick Mahomes' offensive stats, you know, first in EPA against man zone blitz, no blitz, Every, blitz safety coverages, everything. best yeah. problem solver in yes. modern football. And that's all you can ask for. If Patrick Mahomes has a problem, he can normally get out of it himself. If he doesn't, Andy Reed will do it for him. Um, Bill Belichick, number two, little oh, bit. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry. No no, 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 keep going, keep going, keep I, going. We're, remember, we're ranking the dudes. I, we're ranking the and, dudes, yeah. And number two, my number two dude is Bill Belichick. Yeah. Uh, number three, Mike Tomlin. Number four, John Harbaugh. Number five, Sean McVay. Ooh, wow. Okay, let's talk about the guys we have in common for first. Um, so Andrew, Andy Reid, we can kind of throw out. Um, Shinahan, where do you have exactly? I have him six. Oh, sorry. You don't have Shanahan in the top five. Okay. Yeah. Um, don't. As you know, we're not allowed to jump ahead through six through sorry, ten sorry, on this, sorry, sorry. On this okay. one through ten list. Tomlin, I had three, and you had. Yes. Okay. Uh, I had I had three as well. I mean, so let's just kind of get Tomlin out here. Um, I mean, sixteen straight winning seasons is absolutely insane, especially like considering how hard it is to win that consistently in the modern NFL, but also. The end of those seasons with shell of Ben Roethlisberger last year onboarding a new quarterback without your, I feel like somehow we're not even acknowledging enough the fact that they were missing their best player on their entire team for like half the season in TJ Watt. Um, the other thing I, I think that's really telling when it comes to Tomlin's greatness is after the bye. Uh, the offense was excellent. Uh, this is kind of a thing you notice with a lot of really good coaches in the NFL is like after the bye, if the team really improves, you know, in, in some regard, uh, the Jags had this quality as well. Um, you know, they beat up on some bad teams, but they played the Bengals pretty close, Baltimore close. Um, they finished 14th in DVOA with, I think, like, a pretty middling roster in a lot of regards, especially when you consider the injuries in the new quarterback. So I, to me, you know, you got to look to the head coach um, to try to ex ex explain so much success, not just over such a long period of time, but literally the most recent year. I think a lot about the interview that Mike Tomlin did with your colleague, Ryan Clark on the pivot podcast last summer, uh, where it's he basically podcast. said that he, Great episode, great podcast. He basically said he likes, he runs to coaching while everybody else runs away from coaching. And what he meant by that is that people say, oh, this guy, we can't draft this guy, he has poor hand placement. We'll teach him where to put his hands, that kind of thing. And you start to see it. And I, I saw it, I think it was two years ago, where uh, there was a defensive back at Steelers practice and he said, Mike, Mike. And he was talking to a Steelers PR staffer. And Mike Tomlin said, what, what? And the, and the player goes, it was a DB. I forget it. It was a, it was a veteran, whoever the veteran was, the new veteran on the team. Um, 
he said, uh, hey, I wouldn't call you Mike. I call you coach. And Tomlin goes, we're just grown men doing a job. You can call me Mike. And it was like this weird movie moment. It was very like, I, I, I can't even describe it, but I, was, I felt like a fly on the wall there. But it's like, you start to see the respect and the culture that he builds. They hit the crap out of each other in practice when they're running the seven shots. And there's so many training camps you go to where, oh, we're, we're going to do this, this, this new sports science thing and we're going to do this analysis. And they do all that stuff. They have a lot of forward thinking people in that organization. But Mike Tom would be a good coach in 1950. He'd be a good coach in 1975. He'd be a good coach in 1990. And he's a good coach now. Um, that to me is the sign of a guy who's never going to go out of style. And that's why he's always really freaking good. I think if we all the coaches were on a desert island and I had to pick one coach to lead us all, I would pick Tomlin. He's not my number one coach on this list. But uh, just the sheer I feel like it, if we... Yes. If we, as like, if we were facing an, like an apocalyptic event, like in white noise and we had to like follow yeah. a leader, it would yeah. definitely be, we had to be like, yeah. I'm, that's a leader of men. That's a leader definitely of men. the guy you'd want to be president out of this list. Like we are going to build a culture. We have 11 hours to live and we're going to have a good culture for the rest of that 11 hours. And Mike Tomlin's going to lead us there. And, and so, you know, I always, I think it's a really important distinction, this concept of like leadership from players coach, which is by the, you know, something that cannot be interpreted as a bit coded and has been used that way in the past. And I, Mike Tomlin is a player's coach, but he's also a leader of those players. He's also a brilliant football mind. He's good at situational football. Like he's pretty much good at everything um, you would want in a head coach. I actually view John Harbaugh, who you had five, I think, and I have four, correct? Right? I have, I have, I have them four. Yeah, we both and have four. Okay. Sean, yeah. Sean McVay is five. Okay. Who, Sean McVay, so, who you clearly hate. <laughs> Don't hate Sean McVay. But we both have John Harbaugh four, and I think let's just talk about him too because I, I feel sort of similarly about him. Um, I think it's uh, really telling that the Ravens last year seemed like so many things went wrong for this team. You know, like we talk a lot about, not we talk a lot about, but like Lamar Jackson missed the, you know, final month of the season in the playoffs, but they were missing a lot of other very important players. Rashad Bateman misses 11 games. JK Dobbins barely played. And when he did play, he didn't get that many carries. Despite all of this, despite injuries in the secondary at times, this team still finished seventh in DVOA. They still finished eighth in, in uh, points margin. Uh, they almost knocked off Cincinnati with a Tyler Huntley led offense. Uh, he has shown over the years that he can adapt, handle adversity, handle what was one of the more chaotic off seasons in the NFL. I mean, I can't get the image of my, in my mind out of my mind, Kevin, of the owners meetings when the news, when Lamar Jackson's trade request broke right before John Harbaugh spoke and he seemed totally unrattled or j just completely unflappable. Mm -hmm. um, not every head coach would have handled that that way. So you have to remember, it was not easy to earn the respect of Ed Reed and yeah. Ray Lewis and these veteran guys. And there are practice stories about how hard he had to work to get those guys into the fold. There's a buy-in. The fact that, and I would put Mike Tomlin in this bucket too, the fact that you get basically everybody to buy in over, it doesn't matter if they're a veteran, doesn't matter if they're a superstar, doesn't matter if they're on a draft for agent, doesn't matter. Like, you know, Eric Spolster is just ripping off those guys. Like that's, they, they, we're doing Ravens culture and Steelers culture. Like those guys <laughs> totally get it. And so I, I just, I, I don't, I don't know what you can say. I mean, the ab ability to adapt year in and year out, to understand the players, to make an, I, I have a big kind of Pete Carroll point to make here when I rank him a little bit later, spoiler alert, but like the ability to endure, I think we don't give enough credit to these guys um, to, 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 to rebuild a team three yeah. and four times. And I would say, frankly, even though Lamar Jackson's staying there, hiring Todd Munkin, who I'm going to name as one of my, my X factor guys a little bit later, like that shows you that you can kind of retool on the yeah. fly. And it's funny to me because the AFC North is just such a good roster building um, masterclass because the Browns tried to just totally blow it up and tank and all of this stuff. And it seems to me that the Ravens 
and and the Steelers, who don't do any of that stuff, who never galaxy brained any of this stuff, all they do is consistently win football games, which somehow became an underrated thing in in the National Football League. I think we don't, what also has to be acknowledged is what they did Lamar Jackson's rookie season, making the change at quarterback and then completely change, rebuilding the offense on the fly and buying in all of the way. Again, not something that like a lot of NFL teams would not do that with a dual threat quarterback. Now I think there's more, there's a greater willingness than ever because you're seeing like this success of Jalen Hurts. You've got the Colts saying, we're going to try to do this with Anthony Richardson around the NFL Chicago saying, okay, we're going to build this way around Justin Fields. When Lamar Jackson's rookie season, there were very few examples. I mean, you look at Washington with RG3, but he was a very high, you know, I mean, there was, Mm -hmm. was a different situation. He came in as the the favorite to start right away and like it, it just again i think speaks to how much buy-in john harbaugh has with that team in that organization so and then like you they're, said the fact that they're making the adjustments now i don't think you know like that they moved on from greg roman that they moved on yeah. from wink martindale i thought the defensive coordinator hire has worked out really well he's just managed very well there was a report, I believe it was from Albert Breer, that said that the Patriots loved Lamar Jackson, but they knew they'd have to overhaul the entire offense. Okay? Yeah. Guess what John Harbaugh did? He overhauled the entire yeah. offense. And that's the hallmark of, remember someone said it was the NIL a couple weeks ago, where it's like, the entire sport of college basketball changed when everybody started complaining about one-and-done players. John Calipari said, I'll take him. I'll do it. I'll rearrange everything I've ever known. He's not, this is a guy who was in 1994 at Marcus Camby and he decided, you know what? We're in a new era. I'm going to leave the new era. And I think you can say the same thing about a bunch of great college football coaches now. And you can certainly say that about NFL coaches. And so what they did from going from one year to the next building an MVP offense around Lamar Jackson, his second season, it's one of the top five coaching jobs I've ever, I've ever seen from an, from a staff ever. Yeah. And it continues. Like this is not a, uh, you know, a, a legacy pick. Like they, like we said, what they did last year in the face of adversity was impressive. I think the fact that he made it to this off season was without alienating his quarterback or saying any, like was impressive. So John Harbaugh, Mike Tomlin and John Harbaugh are like the two, it's funny that they're in the same division, kind of like steady, just all around. They're totally the interchangeable on this list, by the way. Totally interchangeable. Yeah, you could, yeah. Um, okay, so let's now let's get to the discrepancies. So you had uh, Belichick at two, and then who did you have? Make at five. So let's talk about Trump Belichick. Uh, he is in my second half. I'll get to where he is in the second half. Um, I'll just start off by saying I just really punished him for what I think was the biggest mistake of his entire coaching career, which was the offensive coordinator thing last year. Um, and I'm punishing him because that was entirely on him. It was entirely avoidable. And it honestly, like, is one of the bigger own goals I've seen Mm -hmm. from a football team in recent memory. So that this is, this is me punishing him for that. And, uh, yeah, for everything that ensued. Every coach on here has made some glaring mistakes. Uh, Mike Tomlin, who we just sung the praises of, started Mitchell Trubisky for September last year, right? Um, Belichick, Galaxy, brand the offensive coordinator thing. But I think that he recognized it. He went back to Bill O'Brien, who we're going to talk about a little later, who mm-hmm. yeah. is going to solve the problems. It's going to be fine. I do think what is funny is that they gave Mac Jones a totally horse uh, offense and and then they were like, oh, by the way, you can't go outside the building to seek help. That's what Belichick was mad about. Don't go outside the building. It's like, no, 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 no. Actually, I actually like Mac Jones for going outside the building and seeking help because he looked around, saw Matt Patricia and Joe Judge and said, actually, I'm good. I'm all set here. I'm actually going to leave at two o'clock and go meet whoever, whoever it is down the road uh, who's actually going to teach me offense. Um, this is a bit of a lifetime achievement award for Bill Belichick. I do think if you're ranking guys you want for one game, again, like if we're in an apocalyptic scenario and the aliens are like, we're going to play 60 minutes of football, we're going to put Bill Belichick in charge of the game plan. Nobody takes, like it's the old, uh, was it, I think it's a Don Shul line. Like he can take yours and beat you and take his and beat yours, right? Like that's what he does. He takes things and, and he, he makes them 
better more more times than not and the things he's done throughout his career switching from the three four to the four three because he realized that free agency um was 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 swinging towards four three players being cheaper because of the way he set up modern defense right um that sort of adjustment 2007 patriots were the first team in nfl history to have more shotgun plays and under center plays like he brought in a lot of ways he invented modern football um, not precisely, but he, you know, there's some obviously innovations he took from other people, but he blended it in a way that everybody ripped him off. Um, there's a there's an anecdote in Seth Wickersham's book where he says that Jimmy Johnson told Bill Belichick that 20 teams will just get out of your way every single year. <laughs> and I think that what's important about Bill Belichick is unless he's hired Matt Patricia as offensive coordinator, um, normally he's never going to get out of your way. He's always going to be in the the competent one third. Of the league. Mike Mayak said something to Chris Long the other day. I was thinking about it a lot where he said that most coaches, the reason that GMs have final say in most places, that most coaches don't see past Sunday, don't see past the first Sunday of the season. Bill Belichick has coached every day like he's going to be the coach for 100 years. Um, like he's got the Doctor Strange, like one trillion simulations thing. And that to me makes him best coach of all time and a coach I still would want coaching my team, Matt Patricia, not permitting. He is the best coach of all time. Um, and, and I want to give him due credit for what the defense did last year. I mean, the, Patriots defense should not have been anywhere close to as good as they were last year. It's a defense that uh, a couple of years ago bottomed out, um, ranked near the bottom of the league in DVOA. I think just a couple of like 2020 uh, off the top of my head. And they made a deliberate goal to get younger and faster. But going into last season, I thought that cornerback group was going to be a serious issue after Stephon Gilmore walked and mm -hmm. JC Jackson walked. And they finished as a top three defense. I think well, first weighted DVOA. Um, it's, and that's entirely, you know, like Bill Belichick like, entirely gets credit for that. I think um, – We'll see with the offense this year. The, the, the other thing I dinged him on a little bit was situational football. I thought he made some really bad decisions, frankly, last year um, in terms of fourth down decision making, amongst other things. So, um, and then there was, of course, some weird special team stuff, which is supposed to be his his forte. But you know, it, it's Bill Belichick. I mean, you know, it's it, it kind of comes down to how much do you wait one year versus. Uh, everything else 20 versus 20. um uh okay so i'm gonna make my case for why sean payton should be f i had him fifth is he on your list yeah of course he's seven okay okay well, you don't have to spoil it yeah um okay <laughs> i just I, I i keep i continue to violate the sanctity of six through ten um Peyton, I mean, so this is one where I know this kind of like undercuts what I just said, which is kind of like, what have you done for me lately? But Sean Peyton didn't coach last year, so he can't, I can't ding him for anything he did. I mean, you know, the everybody knows the record in New Orleans. Um, won the division seven times, highest scoring coaching quarterback duo in NFL history with Breeze. I think what was so impressive about him was the end of Drew Breeze's career. Um, those final two years when they, you know, won the when Drew Brees was sidelined. I mean, and what he did with Bridgewater and Hill, the going thirteen and three, we went five and zero oh with Teddy Bridgewater, if I remember correctly. But then also when Drew Brees played those last two years, and his arm was clearly shot. The fact that they still had one of the most efficient offenses in football, and that he did it for so long over such a, you know, with so many different types of players. Um, I, I think also he's good at all of the sort of edges. He, he's so good at finding edges in the game. He's good at situational football. Uh, he's appears to be a good manager by and large. So I, I feel like for it's, I know like it was Denver. So when the hire was made and, you know, I think it kind of got, there were some jokes. Um, and obviously they paid him a ton of money to take that job. But it, in my mind, was money well spent because they immediately get one of the best coaches in the league and in NFL history. Are you familiar with Greg? I don't, know, I don't want to botch his last name. Dolchich? <laughs> do you know who that yeah. is? Yeah. Do you know? Do you know why we're talking about him this week? Do you know what? Do you know what Sean Payton said about him? No. What did he Sean say? Sean Payton said that he sees, he envisions Greg Dolchich as 
his new Taysom Hill. Oh my god! Which says to me, he's so much that he, better as a tight end than Taysom Hill. That's so insane. Sorry. It says to me that he just sat out for a year at Fox with their buddy Peter Schrager and was just thinking, I can't wait to do the Taysom Hill thing again. Now, listen, <laughs> Sean Payton's been on Sunday's Day twice. I've gotten to uh, pick his brain on this stuff. He said if, if Taysom Hill was on the market, it would they would have had 31 offers um, and that he could play every position. He said that on my show. Uh, the other thing about Peyton and the reason he will always be a top 10 coach is he's a little Belichickian in the sense that he thinks about things none of us would ever think about. Like I talked to him a little bit about this. He's told the story before, but about the onside kick at the Super Bowl against the Colts where he goes out and they plan the onside kick at halftime. He goes out, he realizes he hadn't thought of it, that the kick was going towards the Colts bench. And he was like, oh, my God, you can't have that happen because an onside kick, it's all chaos. It comes down to some ref thing. We have to be lobbying when the ball is, is you know, popping out and stuff. We have to be working the refs. So he literally switched the direction of the kick like five seconds beforehand because he was like, the ball needs to come towards us so we can yell at the refs. Like, sorry, like there's a bunch of coaches who just aren't doing that. Matt Eberflus, sorry, buddy. You're not doing it. You're not thinking about it. And that's a different level. It's, there's schemes, there's culture, there's motivation, there's just implementing and installing, and then there's whatever that is. And that's why Sean Payton is always going to be a cut above. Um, but go ahead. No, I don't know Sean Payton well, but I would. I think it's worth noting here. The only time I've ever corresponded with him, the only times have been over arcane rule things yeah. and i think that is i'm i i, I realize it sounds a little bit like a, a humble brag name droppy thing but i mentioned it to just highlight or to i guess reiterate what you said with this is a guy who is so laser focused on the details of football and this was by the way when he was not coaching so no. I, this yeah this is I would like if I could ha if I could organize a podcast. Brian Curtis and I tomorrow because we uh, uh, Lindsay Jones my co-host is sick. Brian Curtis and I are doing a current coach and player media draft where we just build out a network with the people who are currently in the sports. <laughs> and like if I could build anything like I think my first two picks would be Sean Payton and Bill Belichick talking about like the most obscure football things you could possibly find. They could go for like an hour and a half. That would be electric for people like you and me, and I'm not sure how much, how uh, how many ads you'd sell against it. But I do, I would like that very much. It depends how uh, good their reads are. Bill okay, Belichick well, reading for like a beer company. You have Sean McVay over him, so make explain yourself. Uh, Sean McVay uh, is a miracle worker. Sean McVay, I think, has made the fact that Sean McVay was kind of a joke when he took over. He was really young. He, the room, the rumor, the word is, and there were people were just totally wrong. There were a lot of older coaches in the league who thought that Sean McVay's hiring was so Kroenke could save money because they were buying out Jeff Fisher and they were just going to go with some flashy guy in the LA market and all that stuff. And what's funny is that our, our, Kevin Demoff, who runs the team, has joked about this in the past that, like, actually, LA was the best place for Sean McVay to come because nobody cares about him. They care about Brad Pitt and stuff like that. And, and McVay was, you know, was fit, fit a, a very specific coach uh, archetype. And so we were wrong. He was a miracle worker. Um, he erased the Jeff Fisher stink very quickly. He turned Jared Goff, who I think, I think his rookie year stats were. Andrew Walter esque like that that level um, as far as worst rookies have ever played. Uh, he made him into a Super Bowl quarterback. He is only built on that. You want to talk about being able to endure? Like he's taken veterans, he's taken young players. They've ta they've done this strategy where they don't have first round picks, all of this stuff, and typically he's made it work. The the music stopped last year because they had a banged up offensive line and a banged up quarterback. That's going to happen. That would have happened to Andy Reid. Hell, it has happened to Andy Reid um, over a career that that just sort of what pops up sometimes. And uh, I just I'd rather have Sean McVay coaching my team than Sean Payton. I, I mean, that, that's just the, the, the long and the short of it. It's not fair. there's not a lot that separates them. I'm no, just no, saying. I mean, we're, there's not a lot that separates a lot of these guys. It's fair. I 
Well, once we get into our fabled six through ten. Well, he so I had him at like in that in my next just outside the top ten range. Um, and I think it was for me. Uh, you don't have Sean McVay as a top ten coach? I just had trouble putting him in over the guys of Wolga name. It's really just it, it wasn't it, it for me a lot of it was just like trying to make a case to oust certain guys. I, I punished him for I think, you know, it, he, he what you just described is what he did remarkable kind of revolutionizing offense to a certain degree and then the following year when he realized the quarterback hit the wall you know that getting the quarterback he wanted and building an offense around him I think the reason I punished him was just because hadn't it the track record wasn't quite there in terms of like okay how many years did you have like a dominant offense and also I think compared to some of you, the guy about to talk about, I was thinking, well, if I wanted to build uh, or to pick a guy right now to call the offense, I would choose the guy who we're about to talk about. But you can definitely make a case for it. Um, I think also he's done a good job with his coaching staff, which is bears mentioning. You remember his first year, they had Wade Phillips. Then he went, you know, it was, again, a lot of, a lot of people questioned this at the time, moving on to Brandon Staley. They were wildly successful. He Morris now, the defensive coordinator, is, I think, a very good defensive coordinator as well. So I think he gets a ton of credit for that. I think, you know, he, by all accounts, appears to be a very good manager of people, which matters a lot, too. Um, 1638 so, career, Super Bowl winner. Yeah. Completely changed the organization, which was, a, frankly, going in the exact wrong direction before he got there. I don't know about this one, pal. I don't know about well, this one. So I guess this is a good segue to talk about the guy I do have very high. Uh, and that's Kyle Shanahan. I would take Kyle Shanahan if I was building a team from scratch overall, but like eight quarterbacks in the NFL, which is an absolutely deranged thing to say about a coach. And I don't feel that way about any of the other coaches on this list. Um, the guy I, I think is the best offensive play caller in the NFL. He builds machines that are largely quarterback proof in a way that is uh, just remarkable. He um, has tortured every defense that I've rooted for in my, uh, since coming to the NFC West, but no, we're just, I, I, as a play caller, I feel like the amount of value he brings is so exceptional that if he is the one where, I mean, well, I have him second. So I guess I would say like after Reed, if I was just picking a guy to win one game, I would probably pick him, but I would put Reed above him. Sean McVay and Kyle Shanahan were named head coach in the same year. I know there have been quarterback injuries. McVay's won eight more games over that time period and has won a Super Bowl. So that, that to me, is a bit of a tiebreaker. I love Kyle Shanahan. Nobody self-scouts self as well. Nobody uses – Matt LaFleur used this phrase to me, and I think about it a lot, where he says that Shanahan taught him the illusion of compl complexity, where you're actually doing very simple things that um, – that, confuse defenses to where it's really easy for your offense, but it's really hard for the defense. And I know that that sounds incredibly elementary, but that's what you're trying to do as a football coach, the illusion of complexity. Play sequencing, uh, the run designs are amazing. And he honestly coaches, coaches like every kid, like kind of, if you just play Madden for, for six months, you just kind of realize like crossing routes, outside zone runs, and and that's it, right? And like, you kind of understand and blocking, right? You kind of understand that that's, that's the most efficient way to play football. Um, Richard Sherman was on my show a couple months ago, was just was talking about the story about how basically he learned the Seahawks rules so well, they had to change the defense permanently yeah. because he understood the stress, the stress points of the defense. He said, okay, the Seahawks will only do this at this. Okay. Then let's do that. And let's just exploit, exploit that weakness. I love Kyle Shanahan, but he doesn't have the resume of Sean McVay and we're not doing for, for me, we're not doing top 10 play callers. We're not doing top 10 offenses. We're not doing top 10 cool 
crossing routes or play sequences, we're doing top 10 coaches. And Sean McVay, to me, gets the nod over Kyle Shanahan. I'm sensing you tend to prioritize resume a little bit more than me, which is fine. It's just looking at it a little bit differently. Well, I no, think... I like, uh, what do I like? I like wins. I like championships. <laughs> I like the, 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 uh, other thing the entire I like about, point of competition. Um, Shanahan, I think, is uh, I just did uh, – actually, I don't want to spoil this, so maybe I'm not going to get into it. But I talked to someone at length about the McVay-Shanahan offense of the last five years, mm -hmm. and we talked about you know what Bill Belichick did in the Super Bowl and how defenses adjusted essentially basically to try to stop the wide zone play action passing attack and mm – -hmm. Um, one. one of the things that just kept coming up is how good Kyle Shanahan has been at evolving his scheme in response to different defensive styles and looks. I think we kind of take it for granted that it's like, oh, well, he's got this like team of monstar skill players, but I am not convinced that Kyle Juszczyk would have the career he has if yeah. not for, you know, landing with Shanahan Debo, another good example. Um, so I just think he is a very, very unique football mind. And again, the ability to build an offense that's quarterback proof is insane. All right, six through 10. I'm going to read mine. Oh, wait, I just want to do one more point on Kyle Shanahan. I, t I almost overrate him because when you talk to the other guys, McVay, LaFleur, Mike McDaniel, they all think that everything they learned came from him. They th like every, they're just like, he taught us ball. We didn't know ball before we met Kyle Shanahan. But that's not the list. The list isn't who taught the most ball. Otherwise, like Dr. Z and Peter King would be on this list. I learned a lot from those guys. Well, but I think not it's, on the list. it's 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 not just academic though. It's not like I mean, the dude has coordinated efficient offenses with Nick Mullins. With I mean, he had his team on the brink of the championship. With like what he, you know, I talked about with Tomlin or with Harbaugh. You know, oh, you lose your quarterback. What do you do, right? Because one of the hard things about some of these coaches is isolating them from the quarterback. I think Buffalo is a good example of that. We'll talk about that. But um, the fact that Kyle Shanahan has proven that he can win without not just an elite quarterback, but like even any quarterback is pretty remarkable and unique. Um, okay. And that actually is a good uh, segue to number six on my list, because I think this is a coach that uh, many people would argue against for the that exact reason, which is what well, the tools he's been given to work with. So I have Nick Sirianni at six. I have Matt LaFleur at seven. Wait, no, wait. Uh, yeah, I did one through five. Okay. Sirianni, six. Matt LaFleur, seven. Bill Belichick, eight. Sean McDermott, nine. Pete Carroll, 10 is my my six through 10. What is your six through 10? Oh, boy. Um, six is Kyle Shanahan. Seven is Sean Payton. Eight is Sean McDermott. Nine is Pete Carroll. 10 is Doug Peterson. No Sirianni. Sirianni's 11 for Let's me. talk about that. That's Mike, a good. Mike Vrabel is, is frankly 12. Okay, we'll get to Vrabel because he was. I kept putting him in the list, take him out of the list. But anyways, yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about Sirianni. Um, sure. By the way, I love I love what Nick Sirianni's done, and I, I respect again. Like this is not. I actually have a neighbor because I did this the other day on my pod, and I had a neighbor who came over and gave me guff about not about having Sirianni just outside the top ten. Like it's this is a pro Sirianni take, but he's just he's ten and a half to me. Doug Peterson's yeah. above him. By the way, Eagles so fans, Doug Peterson won you a Super Bowl. I think the ding with Sirianni is what well, one is obviously a sample. You know, he hasn't been a head coach for very long, but the other thing is like he walked into, you could argue what a situation, what an organization, what a team. It's the same thing people would pu punish Jalen hurts for. Right. It's like, uh, like Michael Parsons saying, well, like any quarterback or I forgot what Mike, I don't want to mangle the quote, but the, the, the roster is amazing. Sirianni had an amazing roster, but I'm giving him this amount of credit for a couple of reasons. One, the way he managed Jalen Hurts' career is mm -hmm. not a given. Halfway through the season, handing over play calling to Shane Steichen, understanding that the offense needed to evolve. And then this year, um, the way the offense continued to evolve, he's an offensive guy. Again, I think he gets a lot of credit for that, even if he was given great pieces to work with. Um, I also think when it comes to in-game decision-making, 
the aggression on fourth down, the approach times, things like two point strategy. Sure. Just generally, he appears to be a very modern. Oh, you mean the stuff that Doug Peterson installed there? You mean that stuff, the Doug Peterson <laughs> stuff that he continued? That's what you mean? Uh, the guy who's never yeah, told on my list? Uh, he actually did it at historic levels, but again, that's easier when you have like a human. So did so did Big Doug. Down. No, I'm saying Stiriano literally broke records with his approach. During well, Doug did at the time. Doug is a product of his era. He invented breaking he, records on uh, fourth down. They scored on drives where they went for it last year. I went back and pulled this up because I just had forgotten it. 114 points, which is the most of any team this century. Again, it's just, um, yeah, and they won the Super or they made it the Super Bowl, right? So I give him a ton of credit. You tried to give them this. You tried to give them the process Super Bowl just now. <laughs> Oh, um, this happens when you don't. Ball. Yeah, when you don't, when you don't prioritize resume, you, you give the Eagles Super Bowl. Um, two things to ding him on, and again, he's number eleven. And if they'd won the Super Bowl, he'd be number ten, I think. And he's going to be on this list probably this time next year for me. It's already already on your list and quite high. Two things is if he's, if he is a one game one year sample size, and he is, I and mean, that that's what you're ranking him on because well, if two he years. Continued, I, I no, I, I, I know I've he made the playoffs last year. year. I, I I agree, but I'm saying that the reason to have him as a top ten coach is what he did last year, right? You did I mean, not I have him in consideration after go, this time last year. Would you have even considered years. this time last year? Would you have even considered Sirianni to be a top ten coach? No, he would be in that next range. But when right. I when I'm looking at these coaches, I am considering like, okay, what have you shown me over the last few years? Person, right? Okay, totally fair. Uh, but they didn't have like I, the the path in the playoffs was not that stringent. You know, it was a Giants team that was fraudulent and a Niners team that by the fourth quarter was just throwing out bartenders and plumbers at quarterback. Um, and then they lost the Super Bowl. And they gave the they they should have won the Super Bowl. You played that game a hundred times, they win a bunch of them, right? Um, so that's the one thing. If you're doing one one year sample size, I just mm. sorry, I just have to point that out. Um, and then the second part is, and this this goes back to it's funny because this the argument I'm about to reference has been totally obliterated, but a decade ago, maybe a little later than that, it was always hard to rank the GMs and the coaches because we thought John Schneider was a top five GM, but Pete Carroll was a top five coach. So it's like, how do you separate that? For me, Howie Roseman is, without a doubt, the best general manager in football. So I, mm. I don't, I think, unfairly or fairly, I ding a coach when, on these sort of rankings when yeah. you have the best guy at roster building right upstairs. I'm trying to think of, look at the other guys on our lists. And I mean, this I don't is, know who, This like... is not... This is not anti Syriana by any means. I'm just explaining why I've done Peterson. No, I, I hear Syriana you. Right. I hear you. Like, it's always hard, right? Because, like, you know, Andy Reid has Patrick Mahomes. Kyle Jan has this, like, incredible roster. Uh, I, it's why it's so much easier for us to make the case for guys like, I mean, not obviously Andy Reid is Andy Reid, but I'm just saying, like, Tomlin and Harbaugh, I think we both felt really comfortable having them at three and four because it's like they've done it with and without the talent. They've done, you know, like, they. Both had two GMs. You kind of Both take out the GMs. variables. Yeah, who are go good. Very good GMs. I mean, the Ravens, you know, Oz Newsom is one of the best to ever do it. But I think, or even Peyton to some degree, I think that's why with some of these coaches and the one that I'm going to talk about shortly, at least a, a couple of them who are going to come up, um, this is when you get to 6 to 10, it starts to be like, okay, context, what are we considering here? You know, um, who gets credit for what, basically. I think that's um, pretty much the defining question behind the guy who I had after him, Matt LaFleur, at seven. Where'd you have him again? Like 13th. Okay, right. Not So he's not in your top 10. I wrote like 7,000 words about him last year. Like, I love the guy, but I just don't think he's a top 10 coach right now. He has the fifth winningest record in NFL history, of course, Someone is screaming, well, he had Aaron Rodgers. But I'm giving him credit for the fact that when he came in, Aaron Rodgers was not playing his best football at all. And he if, got if him it was, to... If it was so easy, Mike McCarthy would have done to, it. He didn't. That's <laughs> great. Great way to put it. He got him to buy into his offense. The results were beautiful for a couple of years. That relationship uh, hit a wall. Uh, 
but I have a lot. I really, I think he's a really, really talented play caller. I think we're going to learn a lot about him this year. I dinged him a bit, a little bit for the defense, um, not playing up to its potential and they retain their defensive coordinator, which is a Joe Barry. I think, uh, We'll see how that works out. And I think if it doesn't work out, uh, Matt LaFleur deserves criticism for it. But I feel like he has managed what has not been a simple uh, situation in Green Bay. I mean, he is not the guy who drafted Jordan Love and kicked off that whole drama. But despite it, the team, he has managed it very well in addition to the play calling. So that's why for me, I have him uh, where I do. Yeah, I, I love the guy, and I think that talking to Mike McDaniel last year, he talked a lot about how when he watches the Packers, the fact that he got Rodgers to buy into so many different things um, is really special stuff. And there are certain things that Rodgers really valued in offense. He really he didn't like motion as much. He liked the, using the cadence and to, to, to sort of figure out what the defense was trying to do and trying to draw guys offside and that sort of thing to let the defense declare themselves. The great merging of the playbooks, Rogers preferences, old McCarthy plays with the McVay Shanahan style, I think impressed a lot of people around the league. I love the guy. I wrote a trillion words about him last year, literally called the case for Matt LaFleur, but he is not on this list. That's a great point about the merging. Cause I think it's, it's, you know, when all, when all the friends of McVay got hired, there was a lot of, you know, skepticism and questions. Is the offense going to look the same? And the offense is kind of, there's been so many different deviations of it that have been really interesting. Mike McDaniel being one of them in Miami. And I think the fact that Roger, he was able to basically meld it with, you know, okay, Rogers, where he's going to be in the gun more, this is going to be more RPO centric again, speaks to not just his talent as a play caller, but also his readability. So you had McDermott eight and I had him nine. You had him eight, correct? I believe. I I remember. Yes. Okay. Yes. This was hard for me. Um, Walk me through your thinking and then I'll walk you through my thinking because I went back and forth on whether to include him in the top 10. So, it's a little bit, I know this This sounds weird, it's a distant cousin of the McVay thing, which is we forget the situation he came into. This is a franchise that didn't win, had no history of winning in the last two decades. Um, this is his biggest season. He's going to call his own defensive plays. This is a very, very big deal. He's entering the second year of the Ken Dorsey era. There's really no excuses there. But A, he presided over the Josh Allen transformation, which is as impressive as any leap in the history of modern football, literally in the Super Bowl era. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is in the upper echelon of leaps that a player has made from what they look like when they were drafted to, to what they are now. Um, he did, if you want to just throw that out and just say Josh Allen is a unicorn, fine. He made the playoffs with Tyrod Taylor and Nathan Peterman in a year that nobody expected anything. Yeah. Three of the last four years, he's had a top two defense. Best special teams DVOA in football. I am special teams pilled. Uh, I read Bill Parcells' book, and all it says is if you want to improve things, just be a special teams guy, and now that's all I care about. Um, and, yeah, uh, I just they, – they know who they are. They have an identity. The culture is real. Um, I just they, – they, I was just playing around with stats the other day on, on True Media, and they have the second best yards after catch per reception in the NFL on defense. Like, they tackle. They They're tackle, fundamentally yeah. sound. Um, I think – I just yeah. – I, I know what they are. So for me, um, everything you just said, especially in terms of how they managed Josh Allen's career, how they built around him, the way he's entrusted the types of play callers to do the types of, you know, again, not uh, for, uh, it's he's a defensive coach and there are defensive coaches. In fact, there's been a lot in NFL history who don't let an offensive coordinator come in and say, let's throw mm-hmm. this thing all around the yard. They're like, we want to run the ball. We're going to be conservative. Sean McDermott has not been that guy, and I give him credit for that. The fact that he has he let Brian Dable go crazy. Ken Dorsey, again, very pass-happy offense. Um, and then the defenses, like to, as you said, they've statistically always been great. They were great last year, despite the fact that uh, they lost their starting safety in week two. They lost their best pass rusher halfway through the season, and their best cornerback didn't play until December. And then when he did play, he was still clearly hurt credit to that i think however um the only reason i had some hesitation is 
if this team continues to hit that wall in the playoffs, he, to me, is going to be the guy that people look to, fairly or not. And I think it would be fairly if the defense doesn't evolve in, in, in you know, let Leslie Frazier walk. Mm-hmm. It's his show now. And this has been a very, um, a pretty straightforward defense. I think the defense needs to evolve in a way that makes life harder for Joe Burrow and Patrick Mahomes. And if not, I think it's going to probably be on McDermott's shoulders. He's still Uh, my top 10. I I mean, I just, you know, I had him in my top 10. They're just, you know. No, I, I understand that. And I think that's all, that's all very fair. I'm just, I'm looking like I, I, I feel like if we're just doing resume, if we're just doing resume, honestly, I'm not looking back 15 years here. I'm just looking at, I'm doing maybe, maybe a rolling five-year average here of the resumes. And to me, you cannot tell the story about Sean McDermott without talking about the entire transformation of the culture in that building of the quarterback of the fan base. There's a belief there. Like, I, I, I don't tell you though, I, if they don't make it past, if they don't make it to the Super Bowl, that he is going to be the guy that this fan base blames. I'm telling you, but that's true of like 25 coaches. No, uh, because there's the other 25 teams don't have those sorts of expectations. But he built those expectations. He's no. the guy. He's well, the expectations builder. This is, you know, chicken or egg with Josh Allen. But yeah, no, the I'm just telling you, I I I wouldn't be surprised if his seat is a little bit warmer than you would think. Even though I agree with you, that but, I mean, Doug 10. Peterson got fired. That, that, that tends to, there yeah. are people people yeah. saying that Bill Belichick but, but, is passed. But I don't know if the other guys that we've listed. I don't think I would put any of other other of that. All of the names we've said until this point, Sean McDermott is the only one I would say that about. And I think it's it's a product of all right. The, the let's let's actually let's go through the exercise and, here. Let's go through the exercise here. If they win four games this year, which Sean McD- and and everybody's healthy, there's no out outstanding excuses. Does Sean McDermott get fired? Yes, okay. I really think so. Uh, I had Pete what if Carroll they win? 10. What if they win nine games? Maybe I really think maybe. It depends on what, if they, what, what happens. What if they win thirteen injuries. games and get their doors blown off by the Chiefs in the playoffs? That's what I'm saying. That's. He will be the dude that gets blamed. I'm just telling you. Just saying. I'm, just, it's, I, I'm gonna find somebody else to blame. I'm gonna blame. Uh, I'm not gonna blame Ken Dorsey, especially with name, sure. now that he. Well, he'll get blamed too. It depends on what happens if the defense blows it. Uh, so I had Carroll at ten. Who else did you have on the list? Did we? I think yeah, we I had Carroll guys, at right? nine, and I had Doug Peterson at ten. Okay. Uh, so you had Carroll at nine. I had him ten. Basically the same. Uh, Pete Carroll, you owned me. You owned my ass so hard last year. <laughs> Just dunked all over you, girl. This is this is me taking the L. I questioned him so much, and honestly, there were mistakes were made by him as well. Like I, oh. there are things this team did. You didn't need to run the ball that many times against Dallas in the wild card round. I stand by that. However. Uh, what he did last year with that offense, with the fact that this is a team, honestly, given everything we know now about the Russell Wilson era and how he tried to get Pete Carroll fired, the fact that he kept it all together with him and then immediately continue. I mean, they've, they've been competitive so long, his entire tenure, essentially, but it's not just a, a lifetime achievement thing. Um, what they did last season. He gets a lot of credit. I dinged him for the fact that the defense still sucked. So, uh, and I, he's the defensive coach. So, uh, I actually think he deserves some criticism for the the lack of success of the defense. But he's clearly a very, very good coach and an adaptable one, man. Like, uh, you know, like I feel like like we, I, I had all these. Pre- I was like, Pete's never going to be aggressive. He's never going to go for it. He's never going to throw an early downs. And he just di- changed. He did defense all defense change up. The defense changed over the course of the season, which was interesting. Geno Smith was, by Next Gen Stats, the best deep ball passer in football last year. Geno Smith cooked yeah. 24 51 on deep passes, 719 yards, 13 to 2 touchdown to interception ratio. D 
deep completion percentage, 47%. Amazing deep passer, and he was aggressive, frankly. Um, I do want to quickly give a Lifetime Achievement Award to Pete Carroll before I get into the nuts and bolts of why I have him in my top 10. I was looking at this last night. He has not had, and it was just by the skin of their teeth this year, but he has not had in Seattle a negative point differential in 11 years since he took over. That's crazy. In that time, the Patriots had won three years ago. Um, so this is since 2010. He had one in 2010, his first year, and he hasn't had one since. The Chiefs hadn't had one under Andy Reid, but have had them since 2010. Andy Reid obviously took over in 2013. Eagles had one in 2020. The Steelers, and Pete Carroll is a little bit of a West Coast Mike Tomlin, have had three negative point differentials in four years, the last four years. So Pete Carroll always keeps the Seahawks heads above water. And he's the oldest coach in the league by... I mean, it has, I think he has been for six him, years. Him he's and a little Belichick. Bit older than Belichick. Or, yeah. A little bit older than Belichick. And I think the thing that we don't give enough credit for, 2011 CBA changed football coaching forever. Yeah. Limited practices, limited paddock practices, limited off-season activities. The rules have changed. Um, the athletes have changed. The positions have changed. It reminds me of the old adage about World War I, where they said that the, the soldiers who stayed the entire time rode in on horseback and left on tanks. And that's Pete Carroll. That's Bill Belichick. Dude. And to always keep. Do you want to talk about World War One? No, no, no. That's it's your purview. But then, that's well, my I deal. You don't really do um, like that anymore. I do, I do. But now I have a kid, and so it's less. No, it's fine, you know, I don't. Fine, I don't go in the office. I don't go in the office anymore. That, it doesn't hit the way it used to, and I would make fun of your World War One hair. Uh, well, I graduated from that. Um, so it's. Just really, however hard you think it is to adapt, it's harder as a coach. And the fact that he was able to do it just shows you that Pete was never the coach, was never the, Pete the coach was never the problem we thought it was. I'll include me in this. He also owned me as well. Um, he's now basically on his third iteration of the Seattle Seahawks, and all of them in some way have worked despite the fact that this team sucked at drafting for like a decade, not a, quite a yeah. decade, but like go back, I, I, like, you know who I didn't say dunked on me? John Schneider, because yeah, he had a great draft last year, but it's going to take more than a great draft for me to apologize for the Chris. Cause he, there we're talking like, Eight years of bad drafts, and I am giving Pete Carroll credit for winning in spite of it. Go back and look at the Seahawks draft history, 2013 through like 2021, guys. It's not pretty. Um, let's wrap because I, I completely lied about clock management and it got way out of hand as usual. Doug Peterson, I almost, I, I, I get now. I want to put him in because. The more I think about it, I, I kept putting him in, the taking him out, and putting him in, the taking him out. Um, all the reasons that you have him in your top 10 are the ones that I wanted to have him in my top 10. I just struggled with kicking guys out of the list. But go ahead and explain why. Second half of last season took half a season to get the Urban Meyer stink off. Uh, Urban Meyer was the worst coach in 20 years, 30 years. Bob Petrino was pretty bad 15 years ago. But Urban Meyer put a stink on that is really something else. He was just straight up lying about his accomplishments in training camp. And all the players were like, we, you know we have phones, right? Um, yeah. That's the one thing I'll tell you about modern football is that if you lie about like how many championships you won or games you, you didn't even play in, uh, people can look it up on Wikipedia while you're telling the story. Okay, so just Urban Meyer, next time you take a job, just remember that. Second half of last season, Trevor Lawrence – Second in the NFL in completion percentage. Top 10 in yards per attempt. Third in e offensive EPA per drop back. By the way, big Jared Goff, second in the second half of last season. So there you go. Uh, fifth best play action quarterback for the full season, not just second half. Third shortest time to throw in the NFL last season. They figured out, and this is a Doug Peterson hallmark, what Trevor Lawrence needed to do to get better, and they did it. Again, this sounds very elementary, but a lot of coaches didn't, including Mr. Urban Meyer. Um, I will go on the resume and say that the further we get away from it, everybody on the Nick Foles Eagles team took credit for that team. 
right? And I've heard every single person who even touched a ball bag that year say, you know, I was actually, I was actually me. And I'm talking position coaches, coordinators, whatever. Guess who's, guess who's responsible? There's two people, Howie Roseman and Doug Peterson. And Doug Peterson's ability to coach on the fly, to use the bye week as a, as a, as a second training camp and, and hit and do all of those things, install, yeah. run more RPOs, just incredible. Just incredible. So he's already got the body work for me. And then he installs a culture in Jacksonville so quickly. Andrew Wingard said this last year. He said he would die for Doug Peterson. Um, to be fair, other- coming after Urban Meyer is like the – that's my dream is to be hired for a job right after someone like Urban Meyer because everything you do seems like a tiny miracle. <laughs> and It's the lowest possible – he came in at the, to the lowest possible bar of coaching um, in NFL history. Uh, but you know, you're right. I hear you. Like, I, like, obviously it was a turnaround job. Second half of the season, the offense was amazing. I think what, what is so impressive about the offense in the second half of the season is it wasn't just like, Hey, Trevor Lawrence, run around and do shit. Number one overall pick Trevor Lawrence was amazing, but also I thought he was very brilliant at game planning, all that stuff you saw the chiefs doing in the super bowl. They got that from the Jags against the Eagles, right? The, the motion stuff at the goal line. Um, And yeah, so he has not lost his fastball when it comes to calling an offense. I think for me this year, I just want to see like, can you get the defense playing better underneath you? Um, Being the head coach that falls under his purview as well. But it was a home. It was like such a home run hire when it happened that everybody was kind of confused that he was because it was like a later hire too, if I remember correctly. Um, But yeah, Doug Peterson, no, no question. I mean, I had him. So in my next tier, I had him McVay. Mike Vrabel, who we we talked about this before the show, both of us kept really trying to put in our top 10. The fact that that team, with as much adversity as they've faced in injuries, I don't even, like, this roster has not been that talented at points, and he just continues to drag their opponents into hell <laughs> and and win games despite it. Um, also, uh, sneakily very good at situational football and like rules stuff. And I give him a lot of credit for that. And then I would say the final guy I would, I had in the next tier rising is Dable, but that's just a one year thing. So it's too early for me. Is there anyone else you had in in Zach Taylor? That was a, that was a, yeah, I struggled a little bit with that one. Um, how much of that is just, you know, the quarterback and Lou Anarumu run, but you know, Lou works for him. But those are the guys. Yeah, he hired him. Yeah. He hired him. And also, like, the, my Zach Taylor point that I've made many times this summer and last year is that Joe Burrow took over the offense. Joe Burrow took over the culture. But, like, you have to let him do that. And there are some coaches who wouldn't do that. So It's well said. It's well said. Hmm. Um, okay. Let's take a quick break. Come back and talk about some coordinators. Tickets to the game, merch, meals at iconic restaurants, stays at Caesars Palace, all this can be yours when you bet with Caesars Sportsbook. Win or lose, every bet earns reward credits, which you can redeem across the empire. Now, if you haven't started yet, register using code OMAHAFULL, and then place your first bet up to $1,250. If you win, great, keep those winnings. But if you lose, you'll get your stake back as a bonus bet. We're back. We're going to talk assistants now, specifically assistants with potential impact, good or bad, but impact, important, important assistants. Um, we're going to talk longer about some of them than others. I'm going to, a couple of mine I'll breeze through, but one that I do want to talk at length about, and I think we agree, <laughs> this is a pretty important hire, it was Bill O'Brien, mm. uh, the aforementioned Bill O'Brien I feel, I mean, we don't even really, it's very obvious why this is so important for New England to get this right. You sounded very confident when his name came up earlier. So why don't we start there and you can tell me why you're, you feel so good about this hire. I mean, it's the equivalent of the post Urban Meyer thing you just described. Last year, the offensive coordinators were a tag team of Joe Judge and Matt Patricia. Joe Judge has been weirdly reassigned to whatever According to Bill Belichick, whatever he says, whatever Bill Belichick wants him to do is what Joe Judge will do. It sounds like he's like cousin Greg with the little sticker on his forehead. Like that's that's what Joe it's Judge tough. is has transitioned into. Um, he knows the offense. He knows the system. Um, I've just seen it before, and 
he obviously there's familiarity from Alabama. And I just I don't see how this ends in disaster. I'm not going to say that the Mac Jones is going to become some superstar, but what I am going to say is if anything got off track, it will get back on track. This is the definition to me of, of competence. Yeah. I, I thought this was a good hire. Um, I also, and for all the reasons you described, uh, Bill O'Brien benefits from the, the low bar that I said I wanted in my own career. Um, but I also think, you know, he is has shown a track record at calling the kind of offense that Mac Jones is likely to improve in, in that success of the season. Um, I expect the Patriots defense to continue to be like one of the better defenses in the NFL, the best defenses in the NFL. The offense just needs to be average. And I think with Bill Bryan, they can be average. Um, you know, the, it, it's still a, I, w- I would say... And underwhelming is the wrong word. This is not one of the better group of skill players in the league. They don't have a number one wide receiver. But what I think he can do is find ways to get easier answers for Mac Jones, find ways to scheme them open. I expect a diverse and prolific RPO game, the likes of which we saw in Alabama. I think the plays, the order in which they happen will make more sense. Um, He will, you know, his sequel, this was my biggest quibble with the Patriots offense last year is like, on not just a drive to drive basis, but a down to down basis. Nothing really seemed to flow together in terms of like setting up defense, the defenses to fail. So I think everything coming out of Patriots camp, Mac Jones, simply describing the offense as normal (laughs) bodes well uh, for what this year is going to look like. There's a great um, beat reporter who covers the Patriots, Evan Lazar. He covers them for the Patriots. And I was just reading his latest report from camp and he talked about what he saw or from OTAs, heavy screen game, motion shifts, unique personnel, varied alignments. Great. Great. Like that's, you know, uh, really all we've been kind of asking for in terms of getting the most out of these guys. So I, I'm optimistic about O'Brien. Um, okay, who's your first guy? First guy is Kellen Moore. Um, and you mentioned you mentioned this could be good, this could be bad. I'm throwing up a, a big old I don't know for Kellen Moore. So Ooh. I think he's going to be better than Joe Lombardi. That's not that high. That's a bit of an Urban Meyer bar. Um, well, actually, scratch that. Urban Meyer bar means something different. It means something in Dublin, Ohio. Um, <laughs> but um, so it's playing around with the stats. And last year, the Chargers had 235 plays over 10 yards. Good for sixth best in the NFL. They go to 20th best for plays over 20 yards. Chiefs, Eagles, Niners, best teams in the NFL at plays over 20 yards. So what they're really good at is the 12-yard play. What they're really bad at is a 25-yard chunk play. The only other team with a similar drop-off, your Minnesota Vikings. Um, There was a couple of stories in The Athletic. Uh, Bob Sturm and Ted Wynn did this, and then Daniel Popper and Ted Wynn also did a piece about why they went with Kellen Moore. And part of it was Lombardi, excuse me, uh, uh, Brandon Staley outlined three things. Uh, one was a marriage of the run and pass they wanted. They wanted a different level of play at the line of scrimmage in the run game, maybe a little more toughness. Third, and most important probably, is creating more explosive plays on early downs. Okay, that was one of the outlines. So Dallas with Kellen Moore was 17th in the NFL in early down explosive play rate according to True Media. This is via The Athletic. The Chargers ranked 20th in that. So if that's what you're after, there could be some philosophical mix-ups here. Um, Bob Sturm and Ted Wynn, when they did that piece, had some really interesting, I think this was Bob, uh, Bob section, some really interesting stuff on how a lot of what Kellen was doing was borrowed from Scott Linehan, borrowed from Jason Garrett, and it was still routes that didn't necessarily... Uh, dovetail with explosive plays. A lot of what's called spot routes, talking about curls and hooks, stuff where you're not moving down the field, which is mm-hmm. what lends itself to to explosive plays. And so this is going to be an upgrade. 
Is this going to be turn into the greatest show on turf? Not so fast, my friend. I think what we're going to learn is whether the lack of explosiveness in Dallas's offense last year, how much of that was because of play calling, how much of it was the lack of speed at receiver. Because um, you're right, like it, it, the offense wasn't as expl- certainly as a Chargers fan, you know. The, the, the Dallas offense was extremely efficient under Kellen Moore. I mean, every, you know, the, the, during his time as offensive coordinator, always ranked near the top of the NFL. Um, he, I thought it was creative. I thought his use of personnel groupings to get matchups was very smart. It was a very diverse and successful run game during, again, most of his tenure there. Uh, but as a Chargers fan, the one thing you've been vote for, like obsessed about the, the one thing that bothers you the most about this team is that you have a quarterback with a rocket launcher attached to his arm who doesn't push the ball downfield very much. And if you have a coordinator who um, is not, you know, going to push the offense in that direction, that is a big problem. Uh, but my, I think question or my hope for more in this offense is that it was more about the players that they had in Dallas, especially at the end there. I, Cause I do think the lack of separation downfield was a big problem for that offense, but you're right. We'll see. Well, I think we'll see pretty quickly. Um, it's, it's like a great litmus test year for Herbert, for Brandon Staley, and also for Kellen Moore, because of this is what's nice when, when a, uh, coach changes situation is you learn a lot about him, right? Because, in the previous position, it was kind of like, okay, well, context, what was, can, can you separate him from the context? Well, now you're separating him from the context. So, also, Shoddy's back. Shod, Shoddy's back now that we know that Russell Wilson was holding him back. <sighs> Shoddy. Uh, okay. Uh, I have Arthur Smith, which is not really, he, he's a head coach, I know, but he is play caller in Atlanta. Um, for the simple reason that if Atlanta wants to win the division, and I think that is the goal, uh, that he is going to have to call the hell out of that offense. Um, they are rolling with Desmond Ritter at quarterback. In my rewatch of Desmond Ritter, I came away with some mixed feelings about Ritter. I talked about them last week. I came away very impressed by Arthur Smith <laughs> again. He's like, I think he's a very, very good play caller. He's very creative. He's very good at getting guys open. He's very good at screwing with defenses at the second level. This is reflected in the offense's efficiency despite – major quarterback issues for much of the season. Uh, so he's going to have to be in his bag. It's not a particularly complex case. I agree. I'm, I'm that Falcons team is pulling in a bunch of different directions and just hopefully there's some cohesion that is brought together by play calling. Who's next for you? How about Sean Desai? Um, the Eagles new defensive coordinator, the new Jonathan Gannon. Uh, which I actually watched the extended cut of the Jonathan Gannon saying hello to his new team the other day. We, we just played a video of Gannon on NFL Live talking about um, Colt McCoy. Is he quietly yoked? Quietly yoked. And also this is via uh, Arthur Smith interview recently into Italian fashion. <laughs> what? Yeah. It's like I don't know what to tell you. I don't know. I honestly don't know what to tell you. I right. wrote that down on my phone. I was like, just, just take a note here. Jonathan Arthur Gannon's Smith strikes Italian me as fashion. a kind of guy though, who maybe thinks everything that's not like a button down is Italian fashion. I don't know. Anyway, sorry. We got, we got derailed here. Possible. Jonathan but why Gannon, would you do, well, how, Italian seems so specific because so specific. wouldn't you just say like English tailoring, like Savile Row? I don't, I don't know. Think We're we going to put a pin in that. I not know about those things. So I've become obsessed with Kirby Smart. Um, and the things he said, he's such a good communicator and I've listened to pretty much all of his, his clinics on YouTube and, and elsewhere. And I I'm starting to see the vision and, and why Georgia is Georgia. And I think that we've failed to reckon with the fact that 60% of five stars now, and the reason five stars are five stars is because it's supposed to be first round picks. 24 seven, they give 32, five stars because that's supposed to be the 32, five, uh, 32 first round picks three years from that class, right? And Georgia takes a bunch of them and then he makes a bunch of them first round picks. 
And I kind of feel like we've failed to reckon with the fact that talent is no longer spread around and that a guy from Arizona or California is just like when you go to Georgia, play for a high school all-star team, he implants that dog in them and then we move on, right? They go to the NFL. And when you think about the athleticism on the Eagles defense, now two years of basically two years of draft classes were just a bunch of Georgia guys. Um, it's going to be down to the defensive coordinator to figure out what that looks like. Now we know what this is going to be. This is Fangio stuff. We've seen him coordinate a defense before. I believe he was in Seattle last year as Clint Hurts kind of deputy. Mm-hmm. But you think about the different roles these guys can have. Jalen Carter, um, Nolan Smith, who's undersized, but on the other hand, um, think about the things that they've been able to do creatively, different type of player with a sound Reddick. They don't, you can take a, a small guy and turn him into a badass. We know how that, how that works. Um, he was under Matt Nagy in Chicago as, as defense coordinator. Let's just go ahead and, and throw that out. But we know what Jalen Carter can do. He can penetrate. He can suck up blockers in a five-man front. Um, he can create room. It doesn't matter. Um, the onus is on you, Sean, to create something where these guys get to show off their athleticism. Having a rotation in the front seven is going to be huge. He's going to be able to do that. Um, Nicobe Dean is a guy last year who I just loved. Um, he's probably going to get some sort of role this year. Um, I'm obsessed with these Georgia guys and their athleticism and the type of NFL players that they can be. And I don't think anyone, that's right. I don't think anyone has figured out what this is going to look like. Mm. And I think that Sean has a lot on his plate in that regard. I think it, you're right. And his job's a little bit harder than it seems at first because it feels like he's walking into this like dream situation. This is a bespoke defense. They were already um, bespoke. I don't know why I went with bespoke. Uh, what's the word? It's because I said on? Savile Row. It's because we're talking about Italian <laughs> tailoring. When everything's all re- all in one and it's like ready to go, that's the word I'm looking for. And it escapes me at the moment. Ready, but um, Ready? Uh, rack, rack? Off the rack? Kind of. Something that's a different word. Um. But yeah, it's like they returned a lot of the talent. Obviously, Lucas Hargrave, whatever. Question marks at linebacker and safety. But I actually think it's not going to be that simple for him because there's an expectation that um, he improves upon some of Jonathan Gannon's mistakes. Jonathan Gannon, perhaps one of the most despised uh, fan base, co- like the fan base's Eagles fan base, really did not like Jonathan Gannon. Um, I can't stop I, laughing at that anecdote about how he was like totally jacked up at the Super Bowl losing party because he knew he was taking a head coaching job. Oh, I did. He was like, hell yeah. Did you see that thing that went viral where he was like, he was talking about a press conference, but then it never happened or something. I forgot. It, like he was complaining about something in Eagles. Oh, media. oh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, he was like, he said he, they were three, and zero every time everybody wanted him fired or something or something. But, or he like yeah. referenced like a specific thing that happened, like a, a Philadelphia media member said something to him and people were like, this never happened. I don't know. Anyways, it doesn't strike me as a huge deal. I'm not slandering him. Point is the fan base hated him. Um, and I think as good as the Eagles defense was, uh, they weren't always great against really good quarterbacks, which of course you saw in the Super Bowl. And I think there's pressure on Desai not only to get the most out of these young players, to because when the Eagles' offense is the same, the defense is not the same. They are transitioning, getting younger at spots. So I think his job is difficult there, and he also I think needs to evolve the de- off the defense scheme wise in a way to confuse quarterbacks more often, the uh, types of elite quarterbacks. That they need to uh, beat to get back to the Super Bowl. All right, that's a good pick. Um, I've got another defensive coordinator, but this is very different because uh, he's he's not walking into the best situation. Brian Flores is a huge mm. and important hire from Minnesota. This is a pass defense that was maybe my least favorite to watch in the NFL last year. I complained about them to no end. They ranked bottom 10 in just about every metric 26 and past DVOA 30th and yards per drop back 28th and yards after the catch yada 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 um they fire Ed Donatel they replace him with Flores and this is maybe one of the most fascinating transitions you'll see because you could not come up with a coordinator who is as different 
schematically as Brian Flores is from Ed Donatel. So just to put it in perspective, the 2002 Vikings were mainly a cover two defense. They played the most cover two in the NFL. The 2019 through 2021 Dolphins, Brian Flores' team, played the least amount of cover two in the Mm -hmm. NFL. They played the seventh most man coverage. Last year, the Vikings defense did not play a lot of man coverage. They blitzed like gangbusters. The Vikings defense last year did not blitz very much. So I, for one, think this Vikings offense will be pretty good um, this season. I actually think they could be better than they were last year. But if this defense doesn't improve largely on the strength of coaching, in addition to some of the younger players, they're not going anywhere as a football team. I was playing with those cover two stats yesterday, and I do want to say one thing. This is totally, I'm going to get to Flores in a second. Lovey Smith in his two years coordinating the Texans defense did not ever, not for one snap, play dime or quarter defense. They never put one more extra defensive back on the field. What? Did not happen. It did not happen. It's in the true media stats. I was looking at it. I was like, who's, I was like, who just doesn't do things? That's what I was looking for last night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and literally Lovey was just like, sorry, diamond I'm quarter defense. I'm all <laughs> set there. I'm going to dance the date I came with. Um, all right. So Vikings expectations for you? Like, I, I can't really, I, you know, I, I, I if understand. If the defense is better and they were awful last year, they're going to compete in the NFC North. It's a weak division. I certainly agree with that. I mean, they have enough. They've got some blue chip guys. So I'm, I'm, I'm not. I don't know. I don't know if I'm a Vikings guy, but I'm not not a Vikings guy. I kind of think like the pendulum swung too much on calling them frauds last year. Yeah, because they weren't. They they just weren't great. They were good at certain things, and I thought I think the offense at the end of the season was coming together. And I get again. I think they'll be good. I just think it's fun. Like. Can, can you think of a recent hire where it was so like, wow, we want someone who's nothing like our ex? Like, this is yeah. dramatic. Hmm. Um, I like Flores as a coach. I remember Mike Tomlin said this last year where he said that you're getting a head coach at a discount because he yeah. should be a head coach in this league and he's not. Um, and so I can only it can only help. I, I think the world of him is a defensive mind we saw what he could do in in new england um he knows he knows what to do so i'm i'm in on this hire i think i think it was a no-brainer i guess one of the best hires of the offseason who do you have next we go any place uh i'm but i am gonna let's just settle in right here because honestly we could just spend another hour talking about this but let's get out of it quickly how about nate hackett who it felt like there was a mismatch last year between player and scheme and i felt like watching it that especially with the run designs that Nate Hackett's solution was just not calling plays. Like I just looked at, I was like, what system is this exactly? Cause it ain't yours and it's not Russell Wilson's. And I know Russell Wilson wants to hold on to the ball. I know he wants to extend plays. Nate Hackett was hired to be Aaron Rodgers coordinator, basically in Denver. That was going to be his job. They ended up getting him. Um, but I didn't feel like there was a lot of, adapting going on there last year he's now back with with Aaron Rodgers there's comfort there Aaron Rodgers is called the West Coast offense the the best offense known to man I think was his phrase and as I said like he doesn't like the motion stuff he likes tempo and he likes um getting to the line figuring it out kind of old school I'll eye the defense I don't need to use I don't need to put a freaking fullback in motion um that kind of stuff and so I think this is probably going to be a better fit for for both for both, and I think that it's on Nate Hackett to show that he's not a fraud. By the way, Matt Lafleur called the plays for Aaron Rodgers during those yeah. MVP seasons, but obviously there's familiarity. And Hackett's role, it seems like, was just to like quote, you know, office space. I am very curious to see what this Jets offense looks like because everything you've said is correct and the assumption is it's going to just be what Aaron Rodgers wants to do at this point. And what I'll be curious is to see is, is that better for Aaron Rodgers at this point in his career? Does it make the most of the skill players who are available to him? 
in New York than what we saw in Green Bay, which I thought I, I talked about earlier. I had Matt Lafleur very high. I think I think Aaron Rodgers benefit. I mean, it was a mutually beneficial relationship, but you know, all that stuff we talk about, like with the motion and the misdirection, like that's it's not just. Uh, it, 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 there's a function to it. It was, I, I thought, you know, like it was, it, it's part of what a reason why that offense was so effective. And Nathaniel Hackett, if, you, if those kind of things are off the table for you, how are you going to create misdirection? How are you going to, what is this play action game going to look like? How are you going to get this run game going? We'll, we'll see what the status of Brees Hall is. Um, there's, some challenges that present itself. It, the benefit, of course, is you get to play with one of the best quarterbacks of all time. But um, yeah, it's not it's not going a, a given, a foregone conclusion that his job is going to be so easy. So it's going. It, it is a lot going on there, and I'll be curious to see how it plays out. By the way, you can tell um, if you like follow NFL media reports who is sourced with whom by who is blaming who for the Denver offense last year. <laughs> Cause there's a lot of, uh, there's competing accounts already. So I think it was pretty bad. I, I, I don't know if I was them, I would just not even draw attention to it. <laughs> they would just be like, that didn't happen. I'd memory hole it. I mean, stuff. Jacksonville, he was okay. I thought, um, I don't. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he might have okay. Blake Bortles and, okay. and p- part of the Blake Bortles thing was just cleaning up his mechanics and stuff. Cause it was yeah. rough. I don't, uh, we'll see. Um, okay. I'm going to be quick with this one. I think Eric, the enemy is going to be obviously a pretty massive factor for Washington. Um, I could the, because Washington is basically. I think they're a good football team outside of the big question mark at quarterback. Our offensive line is a little bit of a question mark too. But um, last year, this was a team that had a very, very good defense. They finished seventh in weighted DVOA and a very, very bad offense. Turnovers, um, lack of efficiency. Twenty uh, eighth in EPA per play. Uh, and so Eric B. I mean, it's like an interesting job for him because I don't, I would argue it's not a crappy job because there's like really good skill players. I think he's got things to work with. And I think if it is Sam Howell at quarterback, he is capable of calling a unique and effective offense based on Howell's skill set. But it's going to be a challenge, the likes of which obviously he has not dealt with in a minute. And Rightly or wrongly, a lot of people will view it as kind of a referendum on who he is because it was so hard to uh, separate him from the context in Kansas City. I feel bad about the timing for basically everybody in Washington. Ron Rivera is coaching first job with a new owner, and he's going to have Sam Howell. Sam Howell probably shouldn't be starting this year. He should probably get a couple more years in an NFL building. Uh, I, I actually do think highly of Sam Howell in some kind of general sense. I don't think he's going to win a bunch of games or whatever. And then Eric Bieniemy gets to call plays completely untethered from the Andy Reid situation, and that's the situation he's going into. So you o- you almost wish everybody else, all three folks, could be in a different situation. And even Josh Harris coming into this and just being like, uh, I don't know, this seems weird. Let's get rid of everybody. You know, like that. That end- yeah. might end up being the default. Um, and also new owner syndrome and all that stuff. And I don't know, maybe he'll hire the NFL version of Sam Hinkie because he was, you know, he was a six, he is a six owner, all that stuff. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know where this goes. I think it's just, I think it's all going to be kind of fine. And I don't, I don't really know if anybody's going to kind of rise above what we expect them to be. I think the, the, uh, the best case scenario, obviously the best case scenario is that hell, hell is good, but uh, I do think it's realistic that the offense is actually better than it was last year and more efficient and that that's a more dynamic option game and the RPO game is effective. So, uh, which by the way, that would be a success for the enemy like that. He does benefit from the fact that like the expectations for this group are not particularly high because of the quarterback. So there's that. I have one more. I think you have one more too. Is that right? Or do you have yeah, two more? I, I, have one, uh, I have one more, but I can name. I, I just, one more? I, I, uh, Todd Monken. Let's get into it. So Jameson Hemsley from ESPN talks about how slow the Baltimore offense was last year. Um, they had the third most delay of game penalties last year with eight. 
And they had an average of, of in real time of a play every 41.8 seconds. Uh, this is like, like, you know, like, the reason we have pitch clock in baseball. Like these were just like Red Sox, like adjusting your glove, like Kevin Euclid outside the, the batter's box type of, of uh, tempo last year in Baltimore. Um, and the reports are that Todd Monk is going to bring tempo. He's brought energy to practice. Maybe this is just spring, June OTA stuff, but it seems like there's a new, a new day in Baltimore with that offense. Um, the Greg Roman thing, we talked about it earlier. We flicked at it. It was great when it was humming, but it had totally run its course. They weren't scoring enough touchdowns. Obviously, they had an athletic advantage in Georgia last year in Athens, but they were number one in red zone offense in the country last year in Georgia. Just absolutely destroyed everybody. I think it was 81, uh, 81% or sorry, uh, they, they, by basically by 15 percentage points, they, they dominated everybody um, every, in the country. And I was watching some tape earlier to kind of just have a basis, even though I'd watch every Georgia game, but you're talking about the misdirection of the run game was crazy. They created space. They had this, a couple th- I was at the national championship game against Alabama, the throwbacks they had to Brock Bowers. Like they made Nick Saban, like a absolute bartender, you know, and they had really good tight ends, which by the way, spoiler alert, they do in Baltimore. Um, I, the Oregon game, I think was probably the game where he made people look the most lost. Dan Lanning knew the Georgia defense. He understood that. He came from from there. He had coached there nine months earlier. Um, Todd Munkin has the capability to be a kind of mad scientist, and that can only help Lamar Jackson. Yeah, I am really excited about this hire, and I'm also just really curious to see what it all looks like because Mm -hmm. Todd Munkin has had many – state steps and or uh for me uh spots landing spots whatever in his career and his offenses have looked different at times what what you just described at georgia looked different from what he did in tampa in the nfl um he, what he has proven i think is, is that he is good at not just at sequencing plays especially i think integrating the run of the pass but um making the most of the skill players that he has and the ravens suddenly have a fascinating group of skill players right like I've talked about how their best personnel grouping now might be 11, which is crazy because this team didn't touch 11 with a 10 foot pole during uh, the last few years for a good reason. So I'm just fascinated to see what the offense looks like with the, the players that they have, how they get the most out of Lamar, how Lamar responds to uh, a properly spaced passing attack. You know, it's just, it's going to be really interesting, and I think it's a great pick because the ceiling is so high. I don't know if they'll get there, and I'll probably talk about them next week when I talk about offenses, but I do believe the ceiling is really, really high because we're talking about an offense that already, under Greg Roman, was consistently a top 10 uh, unit efficiently. And by the way, there's a world in which maybe it turns out that they have to be more like that than, than people thought, right? Like that, that they still should run a lot and use a lot of tight ends and be kind of heavy. So we'll see. I'm, I'm just curious to see how it plays out. I mean, they did, My, they were heavy yeah. at Georgia. Like it was, he can do, Tom yes. can do a lot of things. Like everybody, every coordinator in the press conference says, we want to be multiple. We want to have guys yeah. do multiple things. They like, actually can. They, they were, they could, they can be multiple in Baltimore and Tom Munkin has been multiple. Yeah, I think that when they hired him before the offseason, before the draft, before they signed OBJ, I assumed it was just going to look a lot like Georgia with, you know, two, three tight ends on the field. But then they had these wide receivers and suddenly like, oh, my God, maybe it's going to look totally Lost different. Todd Munkin trivia is that I interviewed him during this time period. He was the guy that made uh, one of the guys that made Brandon Whedon look like a first round pick at Oklahoma State. Brandon Whedon, good college player. Okay, my final pick Luana Rumo. So here's why. I think he's one of the best defensive coordinators in football. I think he's a huge part of the reason why the Cincinnati Bengals team has been so successful. We've talked about this a lot, what he has done. Uh, your colleague, Ben Solek, I remember, I think it was like during the playoff run last year, posted lose defenses versus like the best quarterbacks in the NFL. The numbers are insane. You know, I was earlier, I was talking about how like Shaw Desai, the Seagulls defense needs to be better against good quarterbacks. That isn't the Cincinnati Bengals are the perfect defense that plays their best games and has the best game plans. There is a good place to use bespoke against these elite quarterbacks. Lou has his work cut out for him moving forward because 
what is what seems to be apparent is not too dissimilar from uh, Kansas City, actually, as C- Cincinnati prepares to pay the offense, essentially, quarterback, two wide receivers, seems like they're going to try to keep both of them. The defense is where they're going to save money, uh, where they're going to focus on the draft. Right now, the secondary, as it stands, has a woozy coming back, but outside of him, it's Dax Hill, Nick Scott, Cam Taylor Britt, and Mike Pitt- Hilton. It's a young group. Um, you know, they drafted Miles Murphy in the first round. But uh, to me, this is, in, in some way, strategically, it, it it makes sense because I think they should keep that wide receiver group together, but it also makes sense because they have Lou Anarubo. But he's going to have to bring it. Because a lot of the cool stuff they did on defense was um, based on the fact that they had, you know, Von Bell and Jesse Bates. They're gone. So... Um. Yeah, it's it's just a he's got a difficult job. I will say one correction is they will save money on the defense in Cincinnati, but they will also save money by not letting players take food home. <laughs> um. So just a little correction there, just to paint a bigger picture. Um. So I am in complete agreement with you. I think that Lou. I, I'm baffled if I'm Arizona why. Jonathan Gannon was a better choice than Luana Rumo. Maybe look, I'm not in the interviews. I don't understand this stuff, but like, man, <laughs> Lou gets it. And if you're going to go with a defensive coach, I'd much rather have it than him. He's an elite quarterback killer. Do you know how rare that is in the NFL right now? Like how many, I mean, it's also a good dude, like low key. Like I, I've sat down with him think twice, like honest guy, funny guy. I, I don't know why. I don't know why you go Gannon. Maybe it was the suits. <laughs> It was the Italian tailoring. Um, and they could have gotten the Italian Italian coach and Lou Anarumo. I, I'm a, I'm a Lou fan. I'm excited. I, I, and when I say, like, when we're talking about success of the season, obviously I'm talking about Super Bowl contention for Cincinnati. Yep. That's why he matters so much. All right, Kevin, we did it. Um, I would just like to say one thing. I think you convinced me that Sean McVay belonged in the top 10 by the end. I've had the entire podcast. It's been about four hours to marinate on it and – Um, I'm not going to say who I'm going to take out because this is my podcast and I don't have to follow rules, but, (laughs) but, uh, if you come on my show, I'll, um, I'll make you, then I'm not going to go on your show, but, uh, thank you so much for coming on mine. Check out slow news day, wherever you get your pods, anywhere you want to watch YouTube. Uh, and yeah, thanks so much for joining me. See you pal.